Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. This will want you to continue with redirect examination. Thank you, Honor. Good afternoon, Dr. Samuels. Good afternoon. Yesterday we ended, we were talking about three different occasions when Jody spoke to you about what happened to her on June 4th. Yes. And we discussed what she told you about what happened to her on June 4th. Is that right? Yes. On those three separate occasions when she talked to you about what happened on June 4th, was what she told you consistent each time? Yes. And after she told you what happened to her and what what happened to her on June 4th, when she when she uh, when she stopped telling the intruder story and she came clean with you, what uh, did she talk to you about her feelings? Yes. And what were her feelings after she came clean with you? She's coming clean. Sustained. What were her feelings after she told you what happened? She said she felt very relieved, as if a great weight had been lifted. And had, did she repeat that to you several times? Yes, she did. The, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, being a therapist versus being an evaluator, okay? Sure. Now, in this case, which one were you? I was an evaluator. Okay. And in your practice, have you been a therapist? Yes, I have. Can we talk about what the difference is between a therapist and an evaluator? Sure. Okay. Can t tell me what it is. Okay. Well, in a case uh, where you're evaluating someone, the, the purpose of your evaluation is to create a diagnosis and um, obtain additional information that allows you to formulate an idea as to how the personality structure of the individual is. Obviously, you want to come up with a diagnosis and try to relate the situation that they are in relative to their particular diagnosis. After the evaluation is actually conducted and tests may or may not be administered, a report is generally written for the attorney or for the organization that requires it and that essentially concludes your involvement with that particular person unless you're called in to testify. And you said come up with a diagnosis. Do you always come up with a diagnosis? Well, w yes, generally we do. Okay. Yes. And do those just range? Well, uh, let me ask you this. How do you come up with a diagnosis, generally speaking? Well, the, speaking? the process of formulating a diagnosis is not a simple process. There is no one test or one procedure that allows you to develop a diagnosis with 100% assurity. The fact is that it's necessary to obtain information from as many different sources as you can. So, for example, if, may I use this case as an example? Sure. Um, upon getting the case information, I began to formulate a hypothesis in my mind. A hypothesis is what scientists refer to as a, a process of speculation. It's not a guess. It's, a, it's an idea based upon the best information that you have at the moment. And our job is to obtain as much of that information as possible. So we begin to look at the situation in preparation for meeting with the client. That will often determine the path that we take during our interview. We also may determine at that point what testing we want to uh, engage in. Um, the next step would be uh, an interview, or maybe one, or two, or three, or in this case, there were 12 different interviews. And along the way, as my hypothesis about what her condition is and was, I began to decide on what particular tests I wanted to use to either confirm, or if they didn't support my contention, I would, it would enable me to disallow that hypothesis and create another one and see where we head in that particular case. And that is the process of conducting a, 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 uh, an evaluation. Uh, of course, a report is ultimately written. If additional material makes itself available, an addendum may be required. All right. Um, and with regard to being an evaluator, is there any type? Well, let me compare that to the therapist model. So when you've been a therapist, what's the difference? Well, when you do therapy, a client uh, comes to the office with a presenting problem. They have, a, they have difficulty sleeping. They may be having a marital problem. Uh, they may be experiencing a great deal of anxiety. There are numerous kinds of clinical disorders that people uh, go to a, a therapist for. Maybe stop a bad habit like smoking. 
um, or to deal with a sexual dysfunction in their relationship. Um, the individual reports their story. You try to get a general background. Uh, usually a session or two or three perhaps is taken in getting background information so that you can place the individual within the context of their life to try and understand why this particular problem has developed at this time. If, there are, if there's a spouse or the problem involves children, you would bring in ancillary family members to gather this information. Once you've done that, you can then create a therapy treatment plan. In other words, developing a plan of attack with specific targets and a timeline as to when these targets should be uh, developed and perhaps hopefully improved. The therapy process begins. Therapy is complex. There are many different therapeutic approaches that can be used. You select the best therapeutic approach for the particular client and the problem that they're having. And then, as the treatment continues, you begin to examine whether or not you are actually reducing symptoms. That's our goal. Sometimes in therapy, a psychological test is also given to develop additional information about the client. With a person who's in therapy versus a person who's being evaluated, uh, who would see you more often? Well, usually it's the patient that's seen more often. The ther when you're when doing you do, therapy. Right, when you're doing a, a therapy process, therapy can take uh, months, it can, ta it can take uh, a year or two. Um, we tend to be limited today in the number of sessions that can be provided due to insurance issues, but uh, therapy may take several months. I usually try to complete my work with therapy patients within three to six months. Okay. Uh, Is there ever a blurring of the lines between evaluator and therapist? There should not be. In fact, the, the guidelines suggest that if you are taking the role of an evaluator, you should not be the therapist at the same time or sometimes depending upon the way the rules are written in a particular state, never. Uh, but there are extenuating circumstances that may require that to change. If you're doing clinical therapy, then you would not be an unbiased evaluator, and therefore you should not do an evaluation. So generally, there are two different tasks that need to be conducted, and, and not at the same time. Okay. Uh, and are you concerned at all that you ha had ever blurred the line with Miss Arias? No. And that includes sending her a self-help book? That's not therapy. Okay. I want to talk to you a little bit about the MCMI versus the MMPI. Sure. Uh, they're both different psychological tests, right? Yes. Uh, have you given both of them? Sometimes I use one, sometimes I use the other. There are cases where I might use both. Okay. And in your, in your years of practice, have you used both? Yes. Uh, not always together, I mean, but just over the years, have you used both of them? Yes. So you're, are you familiar with both of them? I am. A, in a situation where you have uh, a, 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 hypo no, a hypothesis, a hypothesis, thank you, a hypothesis about uh, what this person might be suffering from or a particular diagnosis, then what is the better uh, test? Well, they both have their advantages and disadvantages, but I have uh, grown to become very comfortable using the MCMI as my first test. And if I am still confused when I get the results of that test back, I then might administer the MMPI. Now, there also are a whole range of other psychological tests that are available, including an, another one that I used, which is the PDS test. And um, once you have the tests administered and scored, you can then examine the results of those tests to see if they help support or refute your hypothesis which again is a speculation based upon the best available knowledge. And if it refutes your hypothesis, does that mean that you might need to change your hypothesis? Absolutely. And is that something that you do? Regularly. Um, with the, what you said that you feel more comfortable, you've grown more comfortable with the MCMI, why is that? Well, I have used the MCMI in clinical practice rather extensively. And I have found that the results of that test at least to my experience, seem to be a better predictor of the personality characteristics of the individual who has been administered that test because I have an opportunity to work with those folks over a period of time. Sometimes it's almost uncanny. Now, it's not always 100%, it's never 100% accurate, 
but it's, in some cases it's more accurate than in others. But generally speaking, I prefer to use the MCMI as being more related to the diagnostic criteria that I'm working on, and it also seems to be a better descriptor of the personality characteristics of the patient that I begin to learn over a period of time. We heard some talk about the fact that the MCMI has how many questions? 100 and 175. And the MMPI has 567. Does that make the MMPI better because it's longer? No, it does not. Is there any correlation about it? Is there any reason to believe that a test would be better just because it's longer? No. Both tests are accepted in the field. Both tests are readily used. Sometimes they are used together. I, in this particular case, chose to use the MCMI. Being a psychologist for 35 years, would you ever use the MCMI alone? No. Why not? Well, no one test, and certainly no one scale on a test, is should ever be used to make a diagnosis. In fact, there's a disclaimer on the result portion of these tests, and, they, and it says you should never use these tests solely to make a diagnosis. It should be used in conjunction with other available information, which is how I used it in this particular case. OK. Um. Yesterday, you talked about how much you charge an hour. Is it $250? Well, at the time that I signed on for this case, it was, yes. OK. And that's after 35 years? That's what you're charging in this for case? For this case, yes. Let me ask you this. Um, about the MCMI, is a person able to fake their answers? If someone had studied the construction of the MCMI, or any psychological test for that matter, meaning they went into the literature, did um, a comprehensive examination of why particular items were chosen, how to answer various items to throw off the test, it's conceivable that it could be done. I might be able to take that test and generate a result that isn't consistent with my personality. However, the average person is not sophisticated in that area. The literature has to be searched for, and it's not always very accessible, and it's complicated, and it requires an advanced degree to truly understand how these tests are formulated. So uh, while it is possible, it's highly improbable that someone could feign the results on the MCMI. Now also, there are certain validity indicators within the MCMI which would detect when someone is either distorting or lying. There are certain characteristics that are pointed out to you so that you may need to take with a grain of salt some of the results that you obtain. All right. And with regard to Ms. Arias's validity scales on the MCM MCMI, how did those come out? They came out uh, within the norm. OK. So no concerns then? I had no concerns. All right. So let's talk for a second um, about this rope that has been discussed for a while in this trial. Um, did Ms. Arias talk to you during one of the times that you met with her, did she talk to you about the fact that uh, Travis tied her up with a rope? Yes. All right. And do you remember her discussing with you how many times that happened? It happened twice. Twice. OK. And do you remember the discussion about the first time? Yes. Uh, did she tell you that she was tied with just her uh, wrist the first time? Yes. Do you remember the first time what she described to you as far as what she was tied with? I to? do. The time that this may have been told to him. The sting. I, I don't. OK. Let's do this. Uh, Judge, may I approach? Yes. No, I'm sorry, not to you, to the, <laughs> sorry. All right, Dr. Samuel, so I'm giving you exhibit number 537 in case you need it. Mm -hmm. uh, I am talking about notes that you took on April 21st of 2010. Yes. Okay? Yes. And I'm going to object to this matter of proceeding. He hasn't indicated he doesn't remember the date, so there is no reason to show him any documents. I've just provided it so in case he needs it, it's already there. Our objection is 
All right. So when she has discussed with you the use of, of being tied or the use of a rope to tie her up. Yes. Do you remember what she told you with what kind of rope was used? Yes. All right. And out of the times, the, there was, you said there was how many times? Twice. Okay. Out of the times with regard to the first time, what kind of rope was used? It was a twine. That she may have disclosed this. All right, Sister. Judge, may we approach? You may proceed. All right, Dr. Samuels, on what date did you receive this information from Ms. Arias? And uh, if you're going to refer to your notes, you have to let us know. The 21st of April, uh, it was 2010. Okay. All right. And on that date, on April 21st of 2010, did you discuss the rope with her? Yes, I did. And did you discuss the fact that it happened twice? Yes. Okay, let's talk about the first time. When she talked about the first time, did she give you a specific date at all? No. Okay. And would that have been important to you? Not to me. So when she's discussing the first time, did she talk to you about the type of rope? Yes. And what was that? It was twine. Twine. And is that like, uh, did she discuss with you that whether or not that worked well? It did not work well as it burned her wrist and in her, in her words, it didn't work out for us. All right. And during that time, in, when she's discussing it with you, do you remember whether she talked to you about whether she, whether Travis tied her wrists and her ankles or just her wrists? In my notes, I had written wrists. Okay. And then right after she talks to you about the first time, does she talk to you about the second time? Yes. Did she talk to you about the second time? She did. All right. And the second time occurred when? Uh, that occurred, uh, I think, around uh, June. Hmm, um, does it occur on the same day that? It, 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 not allowing him to finish the response. It occurred on the same day as the uh, the incident. All right. And when she talks to you about the second time with the rope, does she, do you did you did did she talk to you about uh, how she was tied? Yes, I have written in my notes that she was tied by the ankles as well as the hands. Now, do you have a specific memory of whether she actually said that, or are you just going off of your notes? I'm going off of my notes. Okay. And during the time of this conversation, this is how you, you're, you've talked to us about how you're writing as fast as you can? Objection. How fast are you writing when you're, when you're listening to Miss Arias? I try not to interrupt someone when they're speaking because the free flow of information can be very revealing. So as they are speaking, I write. And sometimes they speak faster than I can write. But again, I don't like to record because it's an inhibitory process. So there are times when something may occur, my mind may slip, or they may switch the topic, or I just can't keep up with them, and I may miss a word or two. But generally, I can fill in what was missing. If necessary, I can go back, if it's an important fact, and re-inquire once they've finished talking. And if it's an important fact to, to your diagnosis, is that something that you might do, go back and later on? Absolutely. And, and if it was that important, I would then inquire about that again and as, again as many times as necessary until I'm satisfied with the accuracy of the information. Okay. And when it's something that's not important to you, does it matter? Not to me, no. All right, let's talk about uh, I'm continuing with the conversation that you had with her on April 21st, okay, of 2010. Yes. Does she describe for you um, that they had some type of sexual contact while she was tied up? Yes. And during that description, does she um, also uh, does she also talk about having photos taken? Yes. 
And did she talk to you about whether or not Travis took photos? Yes. And in your, in your memory, do you have a memory of whether or not she's talking in chronological order, or is she just talking about that photos were taken at some point? She indicated that photos were taken at some point. So, and did you see photos taken that, that were taken on June 4th? Yes. All right, and I'm continuing with the conversation that you had with her on April 21st of 2010. Do you remember being asked the question uh, by the prosecutor that whether or not Travis, that, she, that Ms. Arias reported to you that Travis asked her to take pictures of him? Yes, I do. But when you spoke to Ms. Arias, is it more accurate to say that they talked about it again? It's actually sustained. Who, is, is there anywhere in your notes on April 21st of 2010, and if you need to refer, that's fine, just let us know. Is there anywhere on there where it says that Travis asked her to take pictures? Uh, he hasn't been asked if he remembers or not. Sustained. Do you remember? I do remember. Okay that it was a conversation between the two of them. Oh, okay. And she was asked to take the camera and take photos of him in the shower. Okay, so was she asked to take the camera? Yes. Okay, and, and it was, you said it was a conversation between the two of them about taking pictures. As best as my, I can regenerate from the conversation I had with her and from my notes, yes, the, I used the word they discussed. Okay. You remember being asked questions about uh, Miss Arias being uncomfortable with the a time that she had oral sex with uh, Mr. Alexander. Yes. And specifically when Mr. Alexander had oral sex with her. Correct. And did she talk to you about this during one of your conversations? Yes. And when she talked to you about it, what was the reason based on either your memory or what's in your, your memory of the conversation, or if you need to refer to your notes, let me know. What was the reason why she was uncomfortable? Objection lack of foundation. Which time? Which conversation? Oh, well, if I'm allowed to ask. OK. OK, then uh, I'm referring to a conversation you had on June 9th of 2010. Yes. OK? All right, so during that conversation, did you talk to her about a time that she felt uncomfortable when Travis had oral sex with her? Yes. Okay, and did she tell you why she felt uncomfortable? Yes. Why is that? Because it was occurring too soon. Too soon meaning what? Well, for her, the relationship hadn't gone on for very long, and they were at some friend's house, and he came in, according to the story, he came into her room during the night, unclothed her, and then performed oral sex. She was uncomfortable, not necessarily with the oral sex, but with the fact that it was occurring before she felt that it was appropriate in this relationship. Did she talk to you about why she would do it anyway? Yes, she did. Um, specifically, she said that she felt she needed to comply in order to maintain the relationship. All right, and what did she think of Travis? She so thought the world- Relevance beyond the scope of the prosecutor's cross. Approach, please. May continue, overruled. 
with regard to uh, the time that we're speaking of when she was uncomfortable and that she d went along with it anyway to keep the relationship. Yes. Uh, did she describe for you what she thought, what type of person Travis was? Well, she thought the world of him. She, um, in essence, placed him on a pedestal. Again, taking into account at the time her self-esteem was very low, the perceived gap between his accomplishments and status in the community and hers was very great. So um, she went along with it because she felt that this was something he wanted and felt that uh, in order to maintain the relationship with someone that she was very respectful of, she went along with the oral sex. All right. Do you recall being asked questions about whether or not Ms. Arias ever talked to you about a specific time, meaning 3 p.m., or for example, a specific time of when she walked in on Travis masturbating to pictures of a little boy? No, that was not relative to my investigation. Well, let me ask you, do you remember the prosecutor asking you questions about that? I do. Okay. I do. And so when you, during the times that you spoke with Ms. Arias, did she ever talk to you about a very specific time? No, and I didn't narrow it down to a particular time because it wasn't necessarily relevant to what, the information that I was interested in obtaining. Would it ever have been important to you then if it happened at 2.03 in the afternoon or 5 o'clock in the afternoon? Only if there were other circumstances that were related to that in which the time was important. But... It, to me, in, at that point in my investigation, and, and even now, it's not, it's not important. Okay. All right, I'm showing you exhibit number 530. Oh, we don't have the screen down, Judge. I, Dr. Sammy, I think it's, it's some water. Oh, sure. Thank sure. you. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> we'll get some. We'll get it from you later. <laughs> okay. Um, put that aside. You remember talking about acute stress, right? We yes. talked about that. Yes. And when a person is in experiencing acute stress, is their short-term memory intact at that point? Did you go specifically to the questions that with regard to the scrap? To the speaking response. All right, approach, please. There we go. Uh, exhibit 530 is a graph of, a, of what happens with the person's memory during acute stress. Is that right? The person's ability to form new memories. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and 
we, I was just asking you a question about when a person is, when we talked about being in the valley, mm -hmm. which is the person, when the person is experiencing the acute stress. Yes. Uh, does that person's short-term memory work? Well, they still can uh, function during that. The world. They still can function within that time frame. But what's going on is not likely to impress itself uh, on the long-term memory functions because the hippocampus is flooded, basically. It is not working properly. So weeks or years down the line, they might not remember what they did during this time. Is That's that what right. you're saying? But during this time, are they able to function? They're able to function based upon previous memories, based upon the fact that they may see th something, uh, they may react, and again, they are in a fight or flight condition. The sole purpose of their body at that particular point, their brain, their body, is to survive. And f uh, evolution has given us the capability of survival. So it allows us access to what we need to survive. And that may include seeing a weapon or running towards a door to escape, that type of thing. So in that situation, you said seeing a weapon. So if a person is in this, experiencing this acute stress and they see a knife on a counter, are they able to see it, realize it's there, and grab it? Yes. And what happens, you talked about their memory being intact prior. What happens when a person is in acute stress? What happens to the, memory, the memories that were formed prior to the acute stress? Well, they should remain, remain intact and ultimately become long-term memories. OK. So. Uh, in this situation, if Miss Arias knew that where Travis kept his gun in the closet, and she knew that from prior times, is that something that she would be able to recall necessarily during an acute stress phase? Well, especially or cry, I would. Especially if she was in that closet, because the the connections, the stimulus connections, would be strong enough to elicit that particular memory, and therefore the behavior, all part of the fight or flight response, the, the, the need, the instinct to survive. Okay. And is it fair to say that with regard to your memory, you don't lose what you already have? Correct. I want to talk to you about something called raw data. in your profession, what, does raw data mean something to you? Raw data is the, uh, the, the basic data that we collect. It can take the form of responses to a test. It could take the form of physiological measurements. It could take the form of the number of times a rat presses a bar. That's all considered raw data, which is then provided uh, to the, either to the psychologist or perhaps working with the statistician where that data can be analyzed and then uh, hypotheses can be drawn from that data. Uh, and you said that the raw data is given to the psychologist, or the psychologist keeps it or gives it to a statistician? Oh, well, it, it could go to the statistician to, for analysis, or it could go to a computer scoring protocol. You know, okay. what, we have choices. OK. And ultimately, that raw data, does it come, come out in some type of a form of a result? Yes, it can come out in the form of a graph. It can come out in the form of a narrative. It can come out in the form of a statistical table or graphs. Depends upon how you analyze it. The, is raw data something that, in your experience, and I'm talking about you specifically, in your experience, is raw data, well, is raw data something that you uh, exchange with other doctors? Yes. Is raw data something that you exchange with attorneys? Generally not. And, Okay, so what happens then if you're a forensic evaluator, meaning you're working for a purpose in court, right? Yes. Uh, and you're hired by one party, a person takes tests, the results of those, not the results, but the answers to those tests. Is that what we're talking about? Yes, raw generally. Okay, that's raw data. Yes. And then the other party hires their own doctor, and does that other party get access to your tests, usually? 
Will they get access to the results? Okay. And do you disclose, do you disclose your raw data, the raw data from the test that you did with the person, to the other doctor? Generally, we exchange data with other professionals who can understand the nature of that raw data, because sometimes the raw data itself can be misleading. So you don't want people who are untrained in its analysis to have access to it. There right. are also some, maybe some HIPAA uh, concerns there, too. All right. So generally speaking, in your practice, do you generally just disclose raw data between professionals? Yes. And I mean doctors. Yes. We talked, I don't remember now if it was Monday or Tuesday, but I know that the prosecutor, uh, I'm showing you Exhibit 533. See the part one at the top? Yes. Do you know what this is? Yes, those are a list of traumatic, potential traumatic uh, situations that form part of the post-traumatic stress disorder scale. All right, so are these questions from the PDS test? Yes. And we see, like number one, we see in the uh, parentheses, yes. Yes. Is that, that an answer? That's an answer. Is this something you typed up? No. Is this? And so that answer, yes, is that something that you would consider to be raw data? Yes. And we see that for each answer that is yes, we see the yes in parentheses. That's correct. And all of those answers, is that considered raw data? Yes. Is this what, the raw data that you got from testing Ms. Arias, is this, is this yours? Well, the raw data is, but this particular form is not mine. Okay, so you didn't type this up? No. And this particular typed up form goes all the way through to, I guess it just does part one and part two. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. And that wasn't the end of the test, was it? No, there are two other parts. Okay. And the questions are actually go up to what, 49? 49 questions all told. All right. And what did we see here? It went up to just question 14? Yeah. By the way, it's not right to characterize them as questions. They're oh. really statements. Oh, statements. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Is that one of the reasons why attorneys shouldn't get raw data because we don't understand it? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. And so let me ask you this. Did you ever disclose this particular raw data to uh, Ms. Aries' attorneys? No, I did not. Did you ever disclose this particular raw data to Mr. Martinez? No, I did not. Is there somebody that you did disclose it to? Yes, I did. Who was that? That was Dr. DeMarte. And is that a doctor who's hired by the prosecutor? She is, yes. And you disclosed this raw data to her? Yes. Is that the only person? Yes. And we know that from Exhibit 530... 533, we know it ended up in court. Yes. All right. I want to talk to you about the PDS test, okay? Very well. And if it's all right, may I approach, Judge? I'm handing you what an evidence is Exhibit 534. Is this the handwritten? Uh, yes. The handwriting from the answers to the statements of the yeah. PDS? Yes, they are. Okay. All right. And you took that and then transferred it to a sheet that actually has the little, the little fill in circles. That's correct. Okay. All right. I am showing you what's in evidence is Exhibit 540. This is the PDS, PDS test, right? Yeah, that is the, uh, the package I put together that contains the instructions as well as, I believe, the score sheet. Okay. And the first couple of pages you said are instructions. Is that right? Yes. And these instructions, so we make it clear for the jurors, these instructions, these don't go back with the patient or client. No, the patient. Oh, right. The patient never sees that. Okay. Is this something for the doctor who's administering the test? Yes. So what the 
patient or the client sees is what? Uh, there's actually an answer sheet. There's a hand scoring answer sheet. Okay. Uh, the, and actually, well, that's what the patient normally would see. I didn't have that with me, but this is what the patient sees. What you're showing on the screen right now are a list of the items that they respond to, yes or no. Okay. And the, what I'm showing you right now starts at the top with, uh, well, near the top says part one. Correct. At, and it starts with, you see the instructions there? Is that something that the patient would see then? Yes. Does the patient, is there any instructions that the patient would ever see that tells them this is a test for, to determine whether or not you have PTSD? No, it does not. Is there a reason for that? Yes, you don't want to bias the person taking the test by giving them a hint as to what you're looking for. That would allow them to distort the test. So this was presented to Ms. Arias. Um, I said, here are, here are some items. I'd like you to read the instructions. Um, I don't have the answer sheet with me, but I do have this uh, filled out. So you can just circle, uh, check off yes or no, depending upon the appropriate uh, answers. And I will transfer them to the official sheet when I get back to my office. So okay. she did not know the purpose of this test. Okay. And when we talk about the, the test itself, it's broken up into different parts. Is that right? Yes. All right. Let's talk about part one. Oh, well, first of all, okay, so I understand I guess that um, this, you gave this, when did you give this test to Ms. Arias? Before or after she told you what actually happened? This is before. This is on 115.10. To what actually happened? To what she says actually happened. Correct. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't hear your answer. Oh, uh, correct. This is before she admitted to the killing. Okay. And so let's go through, let's go through the, the statements, I guess. Sure. So in this part one, it's having the person say yes or no, whether or not they've experienced one of these, some of these statements. Yes. Okay. And what I gave you an exhibit there that actually has our answers, if you need to look at them, oh, yes, here. let us know. Yes. Okay. And that exhibit number is what? Is it? This exhibit is uh, 534. Okay. So with regard to the first one, a serious accident, fire, explosion, did she answer yes? Yes. And with regard to number two, a natural disaster, did she answer yes? Yes. And when she's answering these, are you asking her, oh, well, what happened? No. Uh, is that a proper approach to this test? Well, it could be if you're looking to determine what the factors are, but there is a place where the individual can actually write down what they consider to be the most intense experience. Okay. Uh, but during, while the person is taking the test, are you interrupting them asking, why did you say yes? No, not at all. All right. And with regard to question number three, it's a non-sexual assault by a stranger, okay? And was her answer yes? Well, actually, number three is non-sexual assault by family oh, member or someone you know. <laughs> sorry about that. You're right. Um, non-sexual assault by a uh, family member. That's correct. All right. And sh did she answer yes? Yes. And so, for example, in that, and it's by a family member or someone you know. So. For example, in number three, did you know whether she was talking about Travis or somebody from her past? It could have been someone from her past. It could have been about Mr. Alexander. Okay. And is it important as an evaluator versus a therapist to know which one she's talking about? It's more important if you're treating the individual. If you're using this as the beginning, the foundation for treatment, then a further description of these particular experiences would be imperative to obtain. But that wasn't the purpose of administering the test. I was not her therapist. OK. All right. And so to, on to question number four, non-sexual assault by a stranger. Uh, and she answered yes. Correct. Do you know of, now at the time, she's talking about her, an intruder story to you during this time period. Is Correct. that right? At, do you, are you aware of any other non-sexual assault by a stranger to Miss Arias? Yes. And what is that? Uh, age 13. She was accosted, a knife was held to her throat, 
And this was in some uh, information reported by her brother during an interview. All right. And so with regard to number four, when she answers yes, do you know if she's specifically talking about this intruder story? Or is she talking about when she was 13? Did you know? I didn't know. Was it important to you? Uh, it would have been important if I was doing therapy, but it wasn't important for the purposes of this test. Okay. And number five, sexual assault by a family member. She answers no. No. And number six, sexual assault by a stranger. She answers no. Correct. Now, uh, I'm sorry, back to number five, sexual assault by a family member. I know that, that there's been a discussion, do you remember being questioned uh, by the prosecutor about when Mr. Alexander um, had sex with, or had intercourse with Miss Arias and while she was sleeping? Yes, I recall. And legally speaking, are you familiar with the laws with regard to that? Yes. Relevance. I just approach. Approach. May continue. Okay. So, with regard to question number five, sexual assault by family member, you remember uh, the prosecutor asking you questions about the fact that Miss Arias uh, said no. Yes. And um, and then there was some discussion about the fact that Mr. Alexander woke her up one night and had intercourse with her without asking her, or suggesting it to her first. Yes because she was sleeping. Right. Based on your forensic work is, and, and your experience, do you know under the law if somebody has not given consent, is that considered assault? Yes. Objection calls for legal conclusion. The, what's important for this testing procedure is, is, is what with regard to Ms. Arias? The person's perception of what happened. Okay. So the fact that she answers no, does that make her a liar of any kind? No, it simply means that she did not consider it to be a sexual assault, yet in the eyes of the law, it's considered to be a sexual assault. The eyes of the law, he's not a lawyer. Sustained. Well, you're familiar with what the law says with regard to- Well, I do a great to deal of- Foundation, I'd like to board our domestic legal degree. No, Judge, there's no reason.
continue. Dr. Samuels, earlier on you talked to us about your experience uh, in education, but experience as well, and did you work with sexually violent predators? Yes. And in working with sexually violent predators, did you become familiar with certain uh, acts that were considered deviant? It was part of our training, yes. And part of your training, were you familiar with what some of the laws with regard to acts can be? Yes. And legal laws? Yes. Does it make you a lawyer, though, does it? No. Okay. But because you were making these evaluations for people who were potentially sexually violent predators, did you have to become aware of the laws of the state with regard to what acts were considered illegal? illegal? Yes. And based on that information, according to your understanding of the law, is it illegal to have intercourse with somebody without their consent? No. Is it illegal? Yeah, it's illegal, yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I misheard what you said. Okay. Well, you is want it to say illegal? that again and I'll answer again. Sure. Is it illegal to have intercourse with somebody without their consent? Absolutely. All right. And with regard to this particular test that you are conducting with Miss Arias, is it important to you what she thinks? That's most important. Okay. All right. Back to the test. Sexual assault by a stranger. Did she answer number six? Yeah. Did she no. answer no? She answered no. And then do we have no's for seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven? Yes. Now, if somebody wanted to make things seem worse for themselves, like they've had bad things happen to them in the past, could somebody on this particular test answer yes? to any one of these questions? Yes, they could, and their scores would go up accordingly. OK. So if, if Ms. Arias was cognizant of that fact, if she wanted to make her score go up, could she have answered yes to sexual contact, for example, when she was younger yes. than 18? Yes. But she answered no. That's correct. And in number 12, they, the, the statement is other traumatic event. Did she answer that? She answered yes. Okay. And is there number 13, did they ask you to specify? That's correct. And did she specify? She did. Do you know what she said? Um, reported, repeated emotional and psychological abuse. Okay. And is that something that you questioned her, what do you mean? Uh, I did, actually. Later on or during the test? Later on, after I had left the room, uh, come back the next time and scored it, I did ask about that. All right, and so what was she talking about? She was actually re -talk talking about Mr. Alexander's attacks uh, or reported uh, physical assault and uh, the verbal abuse that he was uh, directing towards her at various times during their relationship. Okay, so with regard to a traumatic event, uh, based on the way Ms. Arias is answering is how she feels, did she feel that it was traumatic to her? For, to have emotional and physical abuse by Mr. Alexander. Yes. But the, when he had intercourse with her when she was sleeping, that was not traumatic to her. That's right. And had she answered it was traumatic, would her scores have gone up? A um, number four? A uh, number four? Uh, no, sorry. because uh, she had already answered yes to it. I'm sorry, number five. A uh, number five, yes, her score would have gone up. All right, let's turn the page, and we're into part two. With regard to number 14, it, if the person marked yes uh, for something that was traumatic to them, they want, uh, in part one, they wanted to know which was the most traumatic to them. Is that how number 14 is? Yes. And what does Miss Arias say? She uh, endorsed number four. OK. Now, Endorsing number four, which is the non-sexual assault by a stranger. Is that right? Yes. Did you ever, did you ask her what she meant particularly on this test? Yes. You did? Yes. Okay, and what was she talking about? Well, at that point, she was supporting this story that there were two intruders in the house. And so okay. she indicated that she was assaulted and her life was threatened. Okay. So she specifically in number four is talking about the intruders. Yes. The fa that fact that it's then specifically asked about in question number 14, does that get weighed into the end result? No. So 
does the, that particular incident, the fact that she's talking about intruders, does that change her score in any way? No. It would change the direction of therapy, but we weren't conducting therapy. But you weren't what? We weren't conducting therapy. Okay. All right. So whether she answered yes on number four, the non-sexual assault, because she had been assaulted by a stranger when she was 13, or because she was talking about these intruders that turned out didn't exist, either way, would it have changed her score? No. Yeah. That number four involved the strangers, not the attack when she was younger. That's staying. My question, may I approach them? Yeah. Dr. Samuels, once again, whether she was talking about in question number four, that she was assaulted by a stranger when she was 13, or because she would have answered yes for that, if she was, yes. is that right? Yes. Uh, or if she was talking about the intruders, she would have still answered yes in number four. Yes. So either way, is her answer yes? <coughs> yes. So is there any difference to her overall score with regard to this test based on her answer to question number four? No. And because it's specifically uh, in question number 14, asked uh, which one was most important to her, uh, does that have any bearing on the score itself? No, not on the score. OK, so is question number 14 weighted at all, or weighed into the score? Well, it's part of the scoring process, but it's a numerical number. So there's one item circled, it's a score of one. OK. So whether, in other words, it doesn't matter uh, the reasons behind what she puts for number four. It's just that she put number, uh, she marked one. Th that's correct. One thing. Okay. Approach. Dr. Sanders, what's the importance of question number 14 with regard to this test? It allows the individual to specify the nature of the trauma that was most significant to them for therapeutic purposes. Okay. So in other words, if you were treating somebody, is that what you mean by therapeutic purposes? Yes, that's exactly what I mean. All right. Question number, let's go to question number 15. All right, the question is, how long ago did the traumatic event happen? And do you recall her answer? She said uh, three, six months to three years, number four. Okay. And does that fall in line with the time, uh, by the, when you took this test, does that bring us back to the date of June 4th of 08? Yes. It's That's within that time frame. Okay. So again, on this part, does it, at this point, if she's, if she's talking about intruders, does that match the time frame? Yes. If she's talking about the time that she, that she was attacked by Travis, does it match the time frame on June 4th? Judge, yeah. lack of foundation as to which incident are they talking, alleged incident are they talking about? Which, okay. Which time are we talking about when Travis attacked her? I guess there's several. So do you want to tell I'm specifically talking, asking you about June 4th of 2008. Yes. Okay. So is this time frame uh, six months to three years? Is yes. that uh, a time frame that gets us back It's to consistent with, with both of those types of events, yes. Okay. Does it matter, had you done this test after she told you what she actually says happened, would this answer have changed? No. Objective speculation as to 
what she may have answered. Sustained. Okay. When she told you what she says actually happened, that on June 4th of 2008, okay, did she tell you that Travis attacked her? Yes. Okay. Uh, and ultimately that ended up in her uh, protecting herself? Yes. Objection, speculation, on his and beyond the court's ruling. Is that what she, I'm asking? The thing is correct. I'm asking you, what did she tell you that she had to do? She had to protect her life. Okay. And in doing so, was that later on, after she tells you what happens, uh, was that something that was traumatic to her? Yes. And had you given this test to her after she told you what actually ha what she says actually happened on June 4th, as long as you gave her the test within three years of 2008, would this answer have been the same? speculation to what the defendant may have answered. Faint. Judge, it's a mathematical question. The question. Yes. Approach. Me. continue. All right, doctor, the six months to three year time frame. Yes, I, may, I, I would like to uh, clarify a point. Objection, no question before. Uh, let me ask you this first, doctor. Okay. Um, the, the six month to three year time frame, um, the question is specifically speaking about a traumatic event, is that right? Yes. Okay. And did you discuss with Ms. Arias that uh, what happened to her on June 4th of 2008, did you discuss that with her? Yes. And I'm talking about after she disclosed to you what, actu what she says actually happened. Yes. And was that traumatic to her? Yes. Would this answer be in the same time frame? Yes. Okay. And did you need to clarify something? I did. We don't know what he's going to say. Is it? Sustained. Is it relevant to what we were just talking about? Objection relevant. He's not a lawyer. Sustained. Ladies and gentlemen, before we take a Please go back to the jury room. We will bring you back in approximately five minutes. Please remember the admonition. record will show the jury is left the courtroom. Please be seated. We are in re recess for five minutes. Counsel, please approach. <laughs> 